to Church Online this weekend. We're so glad to be here today. And Chloe, we get to actually host together. I know, first time together. First time. It's uh, going to be a wild ride today. It is. Chloe and I have known each other for a very, very long time and we always have lots of fun. And we hope you do too. We have a great service ahead, Pastor Rob preaching. And we just can't wait for the worship that's going to Absolutely. kick off shortly. And we just pray that God blesses you wherever you may be. Absolutely. And if you're visiting for the very first time this weekend, we would love to get to know you. The host is putting in a uh, link into the uh, chat right now. So if you'd like to fill that out, someone will be in touch with you within the next couple of weeks. Okay. Well, shall we get into worship? Absolutely. And uh, just as we're about to do that, let's just close our eyes, settle our hearts and just invite God into this space. Lord, we just thank you that you meet us wherever we are, wherever we are at. And we just welcome you wherever we are right now, Lord, that you just move in ways that only you can and you hear us, that you're blessing us as we just worship you with all our heart. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Over to you, worship team. Welcome church. Welcome to this time of worship. I want to encourage you to be bold and wherever you are, to stand to your feet as we worship the King of Kings. Let's sing together. Who am I? Who am I that the highest King would welcome? I was lost but He brought me
God, we come before you humbly. Father, I pray that you will fill us, Lord God, that there will be freedom as we sing this song. Lord God, there is power in your name. You are with us every step of the way. Hallelujah. There's a grace where the heart is on the fire. I know the way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning. i yes. 
name, by the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be, he will be through it all. So come on me in the space between all the things I see and this reckoning. I know I will never be Thank you so much, Amy and the worship team. I, I love being able to worship. You know, it doesn't matter where you are, mm. in your room, in hospital, you know, on a country beach side. Country beach side, that really a, doesn't make any sense. On a beach or in the country. Yes, yeah. you really just threw me there. So anyway. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but God, God just meets us. He and does. I love it. And I love the power of the internet and how we can um, reach so many more people than Absolutely. just in those who can come to the auditorium Stunning. on the weekend. So thank you, Amy. Really blessed by that. And now it continues. We have Pastor Rob with this weekend's message. Over to you, Pastor Rob. Thanks, Chloe and Kay. And by the way, Kay is making her preaching debut in a couple of weeks' time on the Mother's Day weekend. So looking forward to that. I am looking forward also to sharing with you the Word today. And we're continuing the Cross Examined series. This is actually part six. And if you want to follow this in your Bibles, you can turn right now to Mark chapter two. You'll find message notes and discussion questions on the Bayside Church website and app. Just click on Connect with God and Messages and it will bring up the message notes today. And by the way, with those message notes, if you've never used them before, there's areas where you can actually add your own notes in and then you can email the whole thing to yourself. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, modern technology is fantastic. So on Resurrection Sunday, a couple of weeks ago, we explored another reason why Jesus died. He died so that he could be resurrected. And, and that really sounds like stating the obvious, but without his death, Jesus couldn't have risen from the dead. And there is no resurrection without death. There's no salvation without both events. Jesus had to live, die and rise again. In John chapter 12, five days before the crucifixion, Jesus said these words, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the death, a kind of death he was going to die. And so when he talked about being lifted up from the earth, the people around knew that he was talking about crucifixion. 
And so he was predicting there, five days out from the crucifixion, what would actually happen. And as he's lifted up from the earth, he said he will draw all people to himself. And I love the way that the Bible uses that word all so many times, because as Christians, you know, we talk about insiders and outsiders and we're saved and you're not. And yet when you read through the Gospels, and the New Testament, you find time and time again that what Jesus did on the cross and through his subsequent resurrection was for all the people from all time who live on this planet. And so there's lots of seeds. There's lots of people. If Jesus had, had, had not died and rose again, um, then he would have just been one person who ab abided alone. But because he was um, crucified and then buried, and then rose again, just like a grain of wheat, a, a, a seed that germinates and springs up and becomes fruitful. What we have is salvation made available to every person on the face of this planet. Today, uh, the title is, Why Did Jesus Die? And this is part two uh, of this particular question. In the last couple of sermons in this series, before I wrap this series up, we'll explore a few more of the reasons for the cross. And I spent time over the Easter break uh, digging into the New Testament Scriptures and literally finding every verse that talks about the crucifixion, the death of Jesus, uh, what Jesus did for sinners, um, uh, the blood of Jesus, all of that. And I've included quite a few of those Bible verses in your message notes. And so I really encourage you to go to those and spend some time reading and reflecting on all of those verses. And so it's those verses that we're going to be unpacking over the next few weeks. And so with that background in mind, let's get to our text today, which is Mark chapter 2. And we're going to pick it up from verse 1. And this really is one of my favourite stories in the New Testament. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. And I want you to note that. This is Jesus coming home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to Jesus a paralysed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat uh, the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralysed man, son, your sins are forgiven. An amazing statement. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are, I, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralysed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. What an incredible spectacle that was. It's a stunning story. Jesus has come home and I think that uh, as, as other theologians um, conject on this as well, that this is likely Jesus' family home. Uh, which is why he appears to be completely unfazed by what was going on. The whole house was full of people. There were people all around the entranceway, probably looking in at the windows as well. And these four guys turn up with their disabled mate who's lying on a mat. They want to bring this guy to Jesus, but they realise they can't because there's so many people crowded around Jesus' family home. And so these guys, of course, this is in the Middle East. I mean, you've probably seen the pictures of flat roofed houses. There's often stone stairs going up one of the side walls outside. And these guys carry their mate up onto the flat roof and then they start digging through the roof. Now, let's just pause and think about this for a moment. 
How would we feel? Jesus is, is teaching the Word. He's, he's halfway through His sermon <laughs> to these people. Imagine how we would feel right now uh, as I'm talking to you, as I'm sharing this message with you, if we heard some digging sounds above the uh, TV studio here at the Bayside Centre. You know, there's this kind of scratching, digging sound that's going on right above me and then bits of plaster start to fall down. And, and, and I just continue to preach the word, but at the same time, I'm really wondering what's going on above my head. I wonder if that's what Jesus was thinking at the time. Did he keep going? Uh, what about all the people uh, inside? Were they a bit kind of perturbed by the digging sound through the roof and all the dirt and dust and everything that was dropping down above them? And how big did that hole have to be to let this adult man lying on a mat, how big did this have to be as they lowered him down in front of Jesus? Jesus seems to be completely unfazed by this whole thing. And, and, and in fact, the guy is lying on the mat in front of Jesus now inside the house. All the crowds are kind of moved back a little bit. And the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith. Wow. Not when Jesus saw the mess they had made or the destruction of his roof. I mean, he was a handyman anyway. He knew that he could fix all of this later, but he saw their faith and he said to the paralysed man, son, your sins are forgiven. And then this whole thing of these lawyers grumbling on the, on the inside, but you know, no thought is safe from the mind of Jesus. He knew exactly what was going on in these guys complaining and grumbling about Jesus forgiving sins. And, and of course, he said something to them about why are you thinking these things? And then this amazing um, statement that Jesus makes or a question that he asks to, to these lawyers, what's easier to say to this guy? Your sins are forgiven or take your mat and walk home, saying this to a paralysed man. Uh, obviously, you know, it's easy to say the words you're forgiven, but really hard to say to someone, well, take up your mat and walk home, especially if they're paralysed. But he says, so that you know that I have authority to forgive the sins of people on planet Earth, he turns to this guy and says to him, stand up and walk home, take your mat home with you. And that's exactly what takes place. This is fascinating. And the question, of course, that these lawyers ask, who can forgive sins except for God alone? Well, Jesus is God in a human body. And this leads to an interesting question that I actually raised in the first message in this series. And, and it had uh, to do with the fact that we see all the way through the Gospels, Jesus regularly forgiving sin before the cross. And as you read through the Jewish scriptures, what we refer to as the Old Testament, we see frequently God is bringing forgiveness. And so well before the cross, God and Jesus forgave people, which leads to my question, why did Jesus still have to die? I mean, if Jesus and God could forgive sin without the cross, why did Jesus go through all the pain and all of the suffering why was it really necessary? And so I've been reflecting on this of late. And I believe the answer is actually relatively simple to that question. You see, during his life and ministry, Jesus forgave many of the people that he came in contact with. But what was needed for the entire human race was a universal plan of forgiveness. What we read in the Gospels is Jesus going around, he's teaching, he's preaching, he's healing, he's setting people free. And from time to time, probably when he sees that the person's sins in the past have impacted their life in some way in the present, he just says to them, your sins are forgiven. But that's one person at a time. And that would have taken a very long time. Can you imagine if Jesus was still on the planet in physical form today, and, and the only way you could get forgiveness was by going to see Jesus and him personally saying to you, your sins are forgiven. It would be, you know, worse than being in Coles or Woolies at the deli counter and having to take a number and then standing in line. It's like, well, I've got a number. My number is 4 billion, 
500 million and 33. And I have to wait now for Jesus to call my number so he can call Rob Buckingham forward and say, oh, Rob, by the way, your sins are forgiven. Finally, one person at a time. And here we are, and we're still only halfway through the current population on the planet. And so a universal plan of forgiveness was needed. And that's why Jesus was born. That's why he lived. That's why he died. That's why he rose again. And that leads us to the seventh reason for the cross. As we continue to answer the question, why did Jesus die? He died to take away the sins of the world. Not just one person at a time, but to do something that would take away the sins of the entire world. All the people who have lived, are living, or ever will live, have been forgiven by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This was announced uh, by the angel before Jesus' birth. The angel told Joseph that Mary will give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus uh, or Jesus, uh, the Greek word or the Greek name. Uh, The Hebrew name here is Joshua, by the way. And so Jesus actually would have been known by the name Joshua. And both of those names, Jesus and Joshua, both mean that the Lord saves. And so that's why uh, Mary and Joseph were to call their son that name because his name means the Lord saves. To save here means to deliver out of danger and into a place of safety. In this context, it refers to God rescuing all people from the penalty and power of sin. Which leads me to our next question. And this message will be a series of questions that I will seek to answer. And the first question is, what is sin? Sin is something that we Christians are invariably fascinated by. Uh, I find that Christian people are particularly fascinated by other people's sins. Whereas I think personally, it would be very good for us to look in a mirror and consider our own. You know, love the sinner and hate your own sin rather than somebody else's. The Bible uses several words to describe various aspects of what this word sin means. Uh, It uses words like iniquities or offences, debts, and trespasses, faults and imperfections. They are all wrapped up in the concept of sin. From a Jewish perspective, sin is defined by the Hebrew word chet. It's C-H-E-T. Um, with, and I have a really good friend who's Jewish and so he helps me with the pronunciation. C-H-E-T has that guttural Hebraic sound that sounds like you're gonna spit, right? So chet is the word, and it's actually an archery term. It it literally means to pull back uh, on the bow and to release an arrow, but to miss the target. That's what chet means. It means that uh, you use all the might you can possibly uh, muster in in drawing the bow back and, and letting the arrow fly, but it doesn't matter how hard you try, the arrow always falls short of the target. The Apostle Paul, as a good Jewish man, then adopts this same meaning in his writings to the Romans. Uh, Look with me at Romans chapter (coughs) 3, excuse me, and verse 23. And Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So a couple of Greek words there. Sinned is the Greek word hamartano, and it means I miss the mark. Uh, This Greek word, like the Hebrew word, was regularly used uh, in ancient times of an archer who would miss the target. To fall short is hysterio, which uh, means to be unable to meet the need at hand because you're depleted. As I say, use all of the strength you can possibly muster to bring the string back on the bow, to let that arrow fly, but it doesn't matter how hard you try, you cannot muster enough energy and strength in order to get that arrow to hit the target. This concept reminds me of uh, one of the things that I hated the most about school, and that was the day that we had cross country. I was great at um, sprinting. I, I didn't mind athletics. I was always good at the 100 metre, 
200 metre sprint, it's like, yep, I've got this. Short bursts of energy, and I'd normally come first, sometimes second, in 100 metres, 200 metres, but really, anything more than 200 metres, and I was hopeless. And cross country was like the worst day of the year. I mean, why? Seriously, why does anyone have to run that far? But So we'd go to school and cross country would start, and I'd start okay, but after a little while, I was all out of energy. And so I'd sit down for a while, um, and then I'd walk for a while and then I'd run a little bit more and then have another rest and so on. Meanwhile, everyone's just running past, you know, and they're all going to the finishing line. And I can just imagine everyone getting back to school and, and the teachers looking around, where's Buckingham? Go, oh, so, so the last time we saw him, he was sitting on a log by the side of the river, uh, panting and, and looking like he was going to pass out. And so a little while later, Buckingham turns up and, uh, and, and finally had finished cross country. It was an awful day. Um, and, and I have passed that lack of ability onto my three daughters. None, none of them enjoy cross country. In fact, we get to cross country day and my youngest, Trinity, will say to me, oh, dad, it's cross country today. Can I stay home? And I'll say, yes, of course, which is exactly what I wanted my parents to say as well. I could never finish cross country well because I was depleted. And that's what this word means, unable to meet the need, unable to finish the task, unable to make that arrow fly into the target because you just simply don't have enough energy. And so we could translate Hebrew, uh, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 like this, for all have missed the mark because they don't have the energy to hit the target. The target being the glory of God. Or, or the perfection of God's character. It doesn't matter how hard we try as human beings, we, we cannot hit the uh, faultless perfection of the character of God, no matter how hard we try. All have missed the mark. That's the bad news, but now the good news. And that's the next verse that Paul talks about here, Romans 3, 24. All are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And again, I want you to notice the word all here. You know, we Christians have no problem with Romans 3.23, all have sinned, right? Yep, every, everyone's a sinner. All the people on the planet, everyone's a sinner. And I agree with that. But Romans 3.24 says, not just all have sinned, but all are justified. And then we struggle and we go, oh no, the only people that are justified are Christians. Well, through the cross, Paul says here that God has justified all people. All are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So Jesus has redeemed us uh, through His death and His resurrection. God's grace picks up my arrow and makes it hit the target every time. Isn't that great news? Reflect on that. When, when you're feeling like you're falling short, when, you, when you're feeling like, well, it doesn't matter what I do, I can't hit the perfection of God. Well, it doesn't matter. And this is not an excuse to live a sloppy, sinful life. This is just, you know, in all of us, we, we're imperfect, but the grace of God picks up the arrow and makes it hit bullseye every time. I hope you're encouraged by that. The Hebrew assumption with regards to sin is that if you know what to do, you will do the right thing. And most of us do that. Most of the time we know what to do and most of us do the right thing. Um, but sometimes we miss the mark. And so when we miss the mark, we don't need condemnation. We need help. We need guidance. And that's the Hebrew mindset when it comes to sin. The sad reality, though, is that so much so-called Christian preaching and teaching that I've heard over the years does not reflect that gracious attitude. I've heard more than my fair share, and I'm sure you have too, of preaching that makes you feel guilty and condemned and judged, of hellfire and eternal damnation. But Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to save it. He knows that we fall short of the perfection of the standard of God. And so He didn't come along and condemn us for something He knew we couldn't help. He came to help us and to guide us 
through His life, death and resurrection. Consider Paul's words in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. He says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of the legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. You see, it's not Jesus who came to condemn. It's, it's our sins that, that condemn us, that speak that guilty word. Jesus came along and said, let me take that condemnation for you. Let me pick up that legal indebtedness and I'm going to nail it to the cross, taking it out of the way. Let me help you with that, Jesus comes along and says. And so how did Jesus forgive the sins of the entire world? This is the last question I'm going to seek to answer right now. How did Jesus forgive the sins of the entire world? Well, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament tells us uh, the answer to that. And I've included lots of verses from Hebrews in your message notes and really encourage you to spend some time reflecting on these verses, either on your own or in your small groups, reading these and reflecting on them and discussing them and really kind of fleshing out uh, what the writer to the Hebrews is talking about here. Um, but let me just highlight a few things to answer this question. How did Jesus forgive the sins of the entire world? Well, first of all, it's important to understand that under the old covenant, the high priest would enter the inner room of the temple. It was known as the Holy of Holies and the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year. But the high priest was also sinful. And so the Bible tells us that he had to offer sacrifices for his own sins, first of all, so that he could personally be forgiven. And then he would offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. But this was only a band-aid solution. Animal sacrifices could never permanently erase human sin. And the writer of the Hebrews talks about this over and over again. So the blood of bulls and goats could not wipe away human sins. What was needed was a sinless human being who was prepared to sacrifice themselves. But where would we find a sinless human? Because the Bible's already told us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The only way that a human, a sinless human being could be found is if God himself, the only sinless being, was born into the human family. That's the person we know of as Jesus Christ. God in human form, the sinless Son of Man. And that's why it was important that Jesus was born uh, as 100% divine and 100% human. At the virgin birth, uh, His mother providing the human side and His heavenly Father providing the divine side. And so what we have in Jesus Christ is the God-man who was sinless. And again, I've put lots of verses in your message notes about Jesus' sinlessness. And so Jesus lived a sinless life. And so when he came to the cross, he was able to sacrifice himself as a sinless person and, and take our legal indebtedness and nail it to the cross. The Bible says that Jesus provided purification for sins through his sacrifice on the cross once and for all. And so to summarise this, let's just have a look at a few verses from Hebrews that kind of typify everything that I've just said. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17, for this reason, Jesus had to be made like them, fully human in every way. Why? In order that He might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that He might make atonement for the sins of the people. Remember in part one of the cross examine series, we looked at that word atonement. And sometimes people take that as um, appeasing the wrath of God, but it doesn't mean that. It, it refers back in the Hebrew Scriptures to the day of Jubilee or the year of Jubilee. That's the year that everything went back to normal. Debt was cancelled, slaves were set free, all of society would go back to normal. It was a great reset for Hebrew culture. 
And so that same word here is it typifies what Jesus did for us. He set everything back to normal. All of the debt that we owed through our sin was cancelled by Jesus Christ on the cross. The word amnesty means the same thing. We've had gun amnesties here in Australia many times over the years uh, where illegal firearms can be handed back, no questions asked. Normally, if you're found with an illegal firearm, uh, that would be a criminal offence and you would have to pay a fine. Maybe if it was a lot of firearms, you'd have to spend time in jail. Uh, but during an amnesty, you can just hand them back. In fact, in 1996, we had a, a, a gun buyback where you could take your illegal firearms and hand them over and be paid for the privilege of handing back your firearms. What a magnificent picture that is of the gospel, of what Jesus has accomplished for all of us through his death and his resurrection. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27, unlike the other high priests, Jesus does not need to offer sacrifices day after day for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. So Jesus' sacrifice was enough once for all time, once for all people. Hebrews 9.12, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood. And what did that achieve? thus obtaining eternal redemption. Wonderful. And then Hebrews 10 verses 11 and 12, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. I love the picture there. Jesus had finished his death, his resurrection. Uh, he ascended and was exalted. The Bible says to the right hand of God, he was seated at the place of power and authority, he became God's right hand man and he sat down. What do we do when we've, when we've done a, a big job, when we've had a, a, a hard day at work? We go home and we sit down. What a beautiful picture that is. The day's done, the job's finished. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He sat down next to God, job done. Salvation has been won for the entire human race, a universal plan of salvation to forgive everybody, to justify everyone, that everyone stands before God, not guilty with their indebtedness nailed to the cross and the grace of God picking up our arrow and making sure that we hit the bullseye every single time. I hope you are as encouraged by this message as I am. The gospel is such good news. It's not about guilt and condemnation and judgment and all of those things. If you ever hear a message like that from a preacher, just walk away for goodness sake. Just remember the, the uh, amazing grace that God has poured out upon you through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me pray for you today. Heavenly Father, we just wanna thank you for the good news about Jesus Christ. Jesus, we thank you that you were born into the human family, the sinless Son of God, that you lived a sinless life, that you died on a cross, not for your own sins, but for ours, and you rose again to declare us all not guilty. You are now seated by the right hand of God, seated, job done, mission accomplished, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I say, I hope you're encouraged by that message today um, and that helps you and encourages you to renew your commitment to be a follower of Jesus Christ and maybe even to begin the journey of following Jesus as I did many decades ago. I invite you to do that. And if we can help you in some way, why don't you get in touch? You can email us, the email address is on the screen right now, connect at baysidechurch.com.au. Send us an email or you can click on the link in the chat feed right now. That will put you in touch with us. And we would love to send you a Bible 
and some information that will help you get started on your journey of following Jesus. Uh, when we send you the Bible, or if you already have a Bible, can I encourage you to read uh, one of the Gospels in the New Testament, all right? Don't try and read the Bible from cover to cover, uh, at least at the beginning. At the beginning of the New Testament, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is the shortest of those Gospels, moves really, really quickly, uh, and gives you a quick overview uh, of the life and the ministry uh, and the claims and teaching of Jesus Christ. And so I encourage you to start there and then read other parts of the New Testament. And we've got an Alpha course coming up uh, very soon as well. And we invite you to register for that as well and start your wonderful journey of following Jesus Christ. God bless you as you do. I'm gonna hand back to Kay and Chloe. Thank you, Pastor Rob, for another wonderful message. I love his messages, Chloe. You know, you get to chew them over during the week. And, there is so um, much depth to them. Yeah. And I find quite often I don't want to hear it just once. No, And exactly. that's where this is brilliant because mm. it's recorded. Absolutely. And so you can listen to it multiple times yeah. just to get the nuances. Mm. And I find when I hear it the first time, I'll be focusing on one particular aspect mm -hmm. that God's speaking to me about. And then when I hear it again, He'll speak to me something, else, something else. else. Yeah, it's just amazing. So thank you, Pastor Rob. And we're going to continue worshipping the Lord now around a time of uh, tithes and offerings and, and giving. And so if you would like to give, there are numerous ways that you can do that. One is via the Tithely app, or you can go onto the uh, church website or the church app as well. Over to you. Thanks, Kay. I want to share a recent experience I have had where I found God bless me abundantly. And I firmly believe that it is because I've been giving to uh, his house, either through tithes and offerings and through time, uh, experience, etc., that God has blessed me. And the reason I believe this is because there's so much scripture that says so. You've got, for instance, Luke 6.38, which mm. is a well-known verse. Uh, Give and it will be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running out all over. There's another one, Proverbs 11, 24 to 25, which says, one gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched and one who waters will himself be watered. Beautiful. I've been a part of Bayside Church, I was counting, for almost 15 years. Wow. And it's incredible how that time's flowing. Mm -hmm. And obviously through this time, I have been regularly giving my tithes and offerings. And I've definitely over this time experienced God's blessing abundantly on my life. And I want to encourage you by sharing a recent example. And just through this, I've seen the truth of God's scripture just come to life. As uh, some of you may know, I have a six month old boy. He is gorgeous. gorgeous. Yep. Uh, we love him dearly. <laughs> he is uh, so cheery. The problem, as with nearly every child, except I understand yours are the exception, Kay, he doesn't really like to settle to sleep too yeah. easily. And I found earlier this year, I was getting quite sleep deprived and frustrated with how long it would take to sit at the cot and gently pat him to sleep or resettle him to sleep. <laughs> and it was doing my head in. And I was at church one Sunday morning and just praying to God about it because I was thinking, I don't want to live with this way internally. This is not good for me. Um, and Bayside News that weekend did a shout out to Pastor Rob's podcast, Digging Deeper. And I felt the Holy Spirit prompt me and said, next time you are settling your son to sleep, put in some headphones, turn on this podcast and have a listen. Great idea. So I gave that a shot because I'm like, please, anything. Mm. So sure enough, that afternoon went home, put him down to bed, put in the headphones, turned on the podcast, and it was amazing, Kate. Stunning. Now, Stunning. he didn't settle any quicker. Yeah. He didn't settle with any less grizzling. Yeah. The circumstance was the exact same. Mm. However, my internal circumstance was completely different. I yeah. felt joy. Brilliant. Uh, I felt I was learning and developing my relationship with God, my understanding of the Bible so beautifully mm. that I now actually look forward to these times. Yeah, that's great. And I have found that through listening to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, mm. God has blessed me through the space I have created for Him. And it has completely redeemed this time that I was not enjoying mm. and has resulted in the fruits of the Holy Beautiful. Spirit pouring out. 
And so I want to actually thank every giver um, of Bayside Church because it's through our tithes and offerings that things like the Digging Deeper podcast yeah, absolutely. is able to happen. And there are so mm. many other things Bayside Church does that bless people, myself included. So thank you so much. Mm. And I also want to encourage you, if there is a situation in your life that you just are crying out to God to redeem, and it might be, um, for me, it would also be cleaning. Um, <laughs> it might be exercise, it might be commuting to work. Mm -hmm. it, there are so many different things. Next time you're doing it, pop on some headphones and listen to the Digging Deeper yeah. podcast and let God transform yeah. your life Absolutely. and redeem a circumstance. Beautiful. And I find when we give that we are creating space for God to speak to us and show us how He blesses us. So with that Stunning. message. I love that. And I wonder if you took the headphones out and Franklin heard Pastor Rob's voice. He, he could does, listen to the podcast too. Pa Pastor Rob does say that his yeah. voice puts children to Absolutely. sleep. So I should probably should give, that, give a that a go. I reckon. I reckon. <laughs> Unless he gets very interested and he wakes up wakes from up. it. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe not that. But. <laughs> and I love that, Chloe. You know, there are lots of ways that we can sow into Bayside Church and not just to bless ourselves, although mm. that is important mm. too, right? But to bless others. Yeah. And so essential. Yeah, for the month of May, we've got our First Fruits um, offering coming up. And First Fruits is a time where you are able to give above and over your tithes and offerings and give to Bayside Church uh, so that we can do extra, um, extraordinary uh, giving and blessing of uh, things within the community, projects, uh, Forever Home, you know, all that type of stuff. So uh, we look forward to being able to share more about First Fruits with you next week. Pastor Rob will be sharing on that. And uh, yeah, so it's always exciting. It is, it is, it's exciting. And it's a stretch. It is. It's a stretch, but we get blessed through it. We do get so blessed through yeah. it. So with that in mind, we are also gonna be now blessed with Amy as she sings another song. Thanks, Amy.
let's just take a moment just to stand in His presence. Can I encourage you to lift your hands towards heaven? Take that moment to surrender afresh to the Prince of Peace. holy and anointed Saviour. so much Amy for leading us further into worship it's such a, an is, incredible beautiful. time of blessing and just want to say that is it for today's service thank you so much for joining us now Kay 
In two weeks' time, there is something pretty exciting happening. It is. It's Mother's Day. It is Mother's Day. So, <laughs> whoop, whoop. Yep. Uh, celebration time. And I believe, a little birdie told me, it is going to be your first time preaching it on is, Mother's Day. It is, Chloe. And, you know, when I got asked, I immediately went to the no box. Because oh, that's what I would never, do. Never, not you. And then I went, you know what? What a privilege. What a privilege to be preaching on Mother's Day. And... Uh, yeah, I hope you can join us because I have got, I'm sharing from the heart. It's a bit of a different message to what people are used to, mm -hmm. um, but I am really looking forward to be able to share with you, um, with mums and dads and kids. I mean, Mother's Day is actually all encompassing. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be mothers, would we? No. Without the other two, you know, the other side. We do need multiples. Absolutely. Uh, inputs. Yeah, so really look forward to uh, sharing with you in a couple of weeks' time. Well, make yeah. sure you tune in and otherwise have a brilliant week and we look forward to seeing you again next weekend. Okay, see ya.